All right. So your bell work is kind of going off of what we did the last class period. After we finished the test for unit one, I jumped in by giving y'all a left sheet that y'all had. Uh, before we start, is there anybody who doesn't actually have the sheet? Okay, I believe that most everybody was here that day, so that's that's good. All right, so we start off with the sheet, and I only went through set one, which is the greatest common factor. As you can tell from lesson one of unit two, it's going to be dealing with a factoring review. It's something that you probably were introduced to either at the end of algebra one or sometime towards the beginning of algebra two. The very first thing that y'all do when you go over factoring is just like what set one of the notes did and what your bell ringer deals with. Bell ringer says factor by finding the GCFs of 6x to the second plus 36x. When you're in elementary school, you learn how to do something called factoring. The well, factoring you did back then was finding like the greatest common factor of sets of numbers. It's something you probably did like really, really early on. And the way that you do it is by you take the number that you have and find out what numbers when you multiply them together, get that number. Like examples would be like one times six or two times three. All four of those numbers would thus be factors of six. So when you find the greatest common factor, of both 6 and 36, they have to share the number. And the GCF is the greatest of those numbers. If you were to actually do that, you would realize that both 6 and 36 have what number in common? What's the greatest common factor? Six. 6. So when you're factoring out the greatest common factor, you're going to divide each term by the number. But as we learned with factoring, as y'all did probably last year sometime, you can actually Take the greatest common factor out of the term, not just with the number, but also with the variable. You're going to look at every single term inside of a, an expression equation, probably don't know how you want to say it. You're going to look at every single term and see do they share the same variable? If you actually look at these, do they both have what variable in common? X. The one thing that people usually don't like, they usually don't know at first, they're confused about is. How many x's are we going to take? Because one of them is raised to the second power, but one of them isn't. The trick to this is you're always going to take the smallest one. You're always going to take the lowest of all the terms. In this case, it would just be a single x. Also, another trick is the way you know specifically which one it is, is if the question's in order from highest exponent to lowest exponent, you're always going to take the one to the right. If it's in order, you're always just going to take the right term. You're always going to take the smallest. 6x to the second divided by 6x, you're going to do two divisions. You're going to divide both the numbers and the variables. If you divide 6 by 6, what do you get? 1. And if you divide x to the second by x, whenever you divide variables, you subtract the exponents. Like y'all told me in the last class, you subtract the 2 and the understood 1 that's above x here. So 2 minus 1 would just give you 1. Which just leaves you with a single x. In the second term, is 36x divided by 6x, and that would end up just giving you a 6. You can almost look at it as if, if you're dividing x and x, you can almost just think about it as in these two just cancel out. So what you're left with is x plus 6. That should be the answer to the bell word. Kind of piggyback off this before I jump into set two. In your lesson one notes, I'm going to go ahead and do the first two problems in the greatest common factor area, just so we can have a quick review in case you forgot. After that, we'll go on to step two. So number one, most of y'all should have this, if not all of you. First one is 12K minus 18. A lot of people get hung up if they don't all have a factor or like a number factor and also a variable in common. If they don't have a variable in common, you don't do anything with them. That's one thing that people get hung up on. Just because the first one has a K and the last one doesn't, doesn't mean you still can't find a GCF out of problem. You still can. You can still take the number out. You would actually look at these. The greatest common factor of 12 and 18 would be 6. So you can still divide both of these by 6. 12K divided by 6 would be 2k and then 
Negative 18 divided by 6 would be 3. One thing that I'm noticing that I just did on your bell work is what one thing that I forget to do? I forgot to put the greatest common factor in front of the term. So for this one, we're have been 12K divided by 6 and minus 18K and then divided by 6. The number that you're dividing by is going to go in front of the new expression, the new polynomial. You're going to put parentheses around this part and then put the greatest common factor in front. So make sure you don't forget that like I did. It is a very common thing to forget to do. Please, please, please make sure that you put the whatever you're dividing by in front of the problem. Number two, you're going to have 40x to the eighth power plus 64x to the fourth power. So now the first thing you need to look at with these two is do they have a variable in common? Answer should be yes. You should be able to tell if they both have x's in common. So once you find that out, now you can go about your business. You can see what all you're going to take out of it. First things first, I like to look for the numbers. So if you were to actually look at it, 40 and 64, if you were to actually break them down into their factor sets, you would realize that the greatest common factor they both have would be 8. And now, since they both have x in common, you got to just figure out which one are you going to take out. Always just take out the one that's all the way to the right or the smallest one. It's going to be x to the fourth. So that's what you're also going to be dividing by. 40x to the eighth divided by 8x to the fourth would give you 5x to the fourth because 40 divided by 8 would give you 5. And then x to the eighth power divided by x to the fourth would give you x to the fourth. Then just do a plus sign. 64 divided by 8 would just be 8. Then x to the fourth divided by x to the fourth would just cancel them out. Do the same thing, they would just go away. The last step that you would have to do is just to put the 8x to the fourth in front of the problem. So that's how. You factor by looking for the GCF. At the very bottom of it, you would see something that says, when factoring, always look for a blank first. The answer to that blank is greatest common factor. You always look to do this step first before you do anything else with factoring, before you use any kind of guess and check, grouping, slide and divide, whatever method you have learned. Before you do any of that, you have to look for a GCF first. If you don't, a lot of those methods are going to get screwed up and they're going to come, you're going to come out with really weird answers. So please look to see if you can do this first. Not every single problem will have the GCF be factored out, but some of them will. So always be looking for that. All right. So here comes the first little bit of the new material. We're going to be going over factoring trinomials when the number that's in front of the x squared is equal to one. As you see, you see in parentheses inside your lesson, you see ax squared plus bx plus c, and then it says where a is equal to one. Basically meaning every single number that's gonna be in front of the x squared at the beginning of the trinomial will always be equal to one. If you actually look down at number 11 and 12, that should kind of give you a hint on how to solve those, but we'll come back to those later. So, I'm going to show you the method that I found to be the easiest for factor. A lot of people across both the first class I taught today and the second class I taught today have done these in different ways. Not everyone has learned factoring the same kind of method. Some people learned by grouping. Some people did it by guess and check. The method I'm going to show you to me is the easiest. It is the most hands-on. It's the most visual out of all of them. So if you had trouble with factoring before, pay attention to this method. It may be easier for you. So the very first problem is going to be number five. You're going to have x squared plus 14x plus 45. Pretty basic trinomial, pretty basic factoring problem. Remember, whenever you're factoring, your goal is to get an answer that looks very similar to this. It's going to be like x plus 5, x plus 9. Your answer should look something like that. You're trying to get two binomial sets. 
or x is plus or minus something times x plus minus something. It's supposed to look something like this for those of you who haven't seen it in a while. Here's how you do it. So the method I'm going to teach you is called the box method. Its name basically represents on how you're going to solve it. Like I said, I don't know if you've heard this method or were taught this method, but if you haven't, here it is. It's a three-step method. And the first and the last step are extremely consistent. They really don't ever change. All of the math work basically comes in the second step, and it's not really anything too crazy. It's something very similar that you did with GCF. So the first step, if you're going to draw a box with four smaller boxes in the middle, looks kind of odd at first, but trust me, it goes somewhere. The first step is to draw your box and to put the first term and the last term in the box. The first term is always going to go in the top left. Your x squared or whatever variable squared is always going to go in the top left. And the last term, whether it's a positive or a negative, will go into the bottom right. This one's a positive, so it's going to be a positive 45 in the bottom right. This is always given. It's, you don't have to do any math to do it. It's just a given thing that works every single time. So you don't have to do anything crazy yet. All of your work comes from this very next step, the second step. You're going to take the last term in the problem, which in this particular instance is a positive 45, and you're going to get all the factors that's for it. You're going to find all the things that when multiply together give you 45. For example, 1 times 45 gives me what? 45. So that is a factor set of 45. Another example of this would be 3 and 15. And the last one, if you were to actually do it yourself, would be 5 and 9. So all of your work comes from you being able to find all the things that multiply together, give you 45. 1 times 45 gives you 45. 3 times 15 gives you 45. And 5 times 9. Once you do this, you're going to add together all of the factor sets to their numbers. Like you're going to add 1 and 45. You're going to add 3 and 15 and 5 and 9. And you're going to tell me what they're equal to. The first one is 46. The second one would be 18. And the last one would be 14. You know, these numbers are going to be the ones that you put into these two boxes. And the way you know which ones go in the boxes are whenever you add them together, whatever their total is needs to be equal to the middle number. What's the middle number? 14. There's only one factor set that gives you 14. It's 5 and 9. If you add 5 plus 9 together, you get 14. So you're going to put that factor set's numbers in the two remaining boxes. You would put the 5 and the 9 in there, and you just put an X behind them. So that's all of the work, pretty much. All of the work in factoring these problems comes from you being able to do that. Finding the factor sets and then adding them together. The last step always is the same, and it's just as easy as the first one. You're going to pull the stuff in the box to the left side of the box and to the top side of the box. Here's how you do it. If you were to look at the top left box, it's x squared. So how many x's do you think are in there? Two. You can take both of the x's out of that box and put it to the left and on top of it. And you're going to try to fill in this spot right here to the left and this spot right here up top. What you're going to put there are the numbers that are in these boxes. Like you're going to take the nine out of the box and you're going to take the five out of the box. And you honestly from right there have your answer. What you do is you draw your little binomial sets like this. And you're going to put each side in their own set of parentheses. You will take the x and the positive nine, and that's one of that's one half of your answer. The x and the positive five go in the other one, and that is how you factor doing the box method. It's a fairly simple method, and it's only three steps. All of your work comes at the second step when you factor out the last term. One consistent question that I have gotten a lot. 
with this is how do I know is it going to be a positive or a negative, or is it going to be a plus or minus, if you would, inside a binomial? There's a reason I emphasize that this is a positive nine and a positive five. If it's a positive number, so they're always going to be pluses. If they were negative numbers, like if this was a negative nine, it would be x minus nine. So it's a negative five, it would be x minus five. So this is how you factor it. So before we go any further, how's everyone doing? Okay. Like Can I, I said, do yes, okay. I'm going to work number five, six, seven, and eight because that's all four of the different types of factoring problems you come up with, where the first one's all positives, and six and seven, one of the other numbers is negative, and then eight, both of them are negative. So I'm going to go over all four different examples. Because another question someone asked me in my last class is like, well, when is it ever going to be negative in there if you're multiplying stuff together? And I told him whenever the polynomial has negatives. So it doesn't get that much more difficult. The factoring part of it just gets a little bit longer when you get negatives in there. Overall, the problems don't get any more difficult. It actually stays the same level of difficulty. This part just gets longer because you get more factor sets. So that's really the only thing that changes. The rest of it is extremely consistent. The first and third step never change. So this is why I like this method the most because it's not extremely difficult. Like after you do it a few times, it gets to be pretty, like you start to memorize the steps, you start to be used to them. It's definitely one of those, once you've seen it enough times, you get used to it. So number six, you have x squared minus 15x plus 26. So here's your first example. Pull oh, one of my other students, I bought a raffle ticket from her. I just didn't think she'd come in the class. All right, so here's your first example of the negative. First step is the same, and it never really changes. You're going to create a box method. Or you're going to create a box, and you're going to put the first term in the top left. It always stays the same. It doesn't change. You'll put the last term, which is a positive 26, in the bottom right. So the first step is done. Your second step, you're going to find the factor sets of 26. This is where all the math comes from. The thing about it is, is whenever you found the factor sets, you're trying to add a factor sets to equal the middle term. The middle term in this problem is a negative 15. You can't add two positive numbers together to get a negative number. It's impossible. So what this basically tells you, whenever you see a negative in the middle, you know that you're going to have negative factor sets. And because the last number is positive, a negative times negative is what? So this tells you that both of the numbers in the factor system will be negative. So it's the same thing where you have negative 1 times negative 26 still equals 26. But because now they're both negatives, you can actually add them together and get a negative number. So that's what happens here. The next step or the next factor set is negative 2 and negative 13. And if you were to add those two together, -15. You will take both of those numbers, just like you did in the last problem, and put them in the box. They just put the x's behind them. From here, it's the same thing in the third step that you did last time. You're going to put the two x's on the left and on the top, and then take the numbers out of the other two boxes. The negative 2 and the negative 13. And there's your answer. You're going to have an x and a negative 2 and then x and negative 13. The reason that they're subtraction this time is because they're both negative numbers. Because they're negatives, they are subtracting the binomial sets. So that is number six. So this is how you can actually get negative numbers in the box if you're curious. If you had negatives in the problem, you know you're going to start having some negatives in the box. It's kind of a dead giveaway. 
Give you a second to write it down. Okay, number seven. It's a different type of negative this time. This time you have x squared plus 2x minus 48. So this time the negatives are flip flopped. The positives down the middle and the negatives on the outside. The first step doesn't change. It's very consistent. You're going to create your box and do your four little squares. And you're going to put the first term, the x squared, top left, and the negative 48 in the bottom right. You're going to take the negative with it. If you see a subtraction sign in front of that last term, it's going to go to the bottom right. Next thing, you're going to factor out negative 48. Knowing your multiplication rules, what times what's going to give you a negative number? Like you said, a positive and a negative. So because you are factoring out or getting the factor sets of a negative number, you know that one of the numbers is going to be positive and one of them is going to be a negative. The question that everyone always asks is which ones are going to be positive and which ones are going to be negative. The answer is they both are. What you end up doing in this is how the factor sets get a little bit longer is whenever you are factoring out a negative number, you're going to write down both factor sets twice. You're going to write one down where one number is negative and then write one down where the other number, the other number is negative. So it's the same thing that you've been doing, but you write it down twice this time. Just make the numbers negative opposite times. Because negative one times 48 is going to be negative 48. One times negative 48 is going to be 48. Just flip off the negatives. So here you go. The next one is going to be, I'm going to go through them all for you. It's negative 2 and 24. And two and negative 24. Next one's going to be negative three and 16, and three and negative 16. And then you have negative four and 12, four and negative 12, negative six and eight, and six and negative eight. So, like I said, the factor sets get a little bit longer. This is where the difficulty, I guess, quote unquote, is where. This problem comes from. This is where the difficulty in this method begins. It's not really that it gets any harder. It's just you have a whole bunch of them to add together, and it just kind of gets kind of redundant. It's, you just keep adding over and over and over again. One quick thing I want to tell you that I've noticed with you know giving tests, giving homework assignments throughout, like me teaching this, is that I've noticed that a lot of the questions. When they have answers from your factor sets like this, most of the time the factor set you're going to choose is going to be towards the end of it. It's usually going to be somewhere like around the bottom end, which means that you are going to have to go through all the factor sets, of course. A lot of times the answer comes towards the bottom. They do that probably to make sure that the student knows how to do the math. So, yes, it gets kind of aggravating, but that's typically how it goes. So if you were to add them all together, you're trying to get a positive 2. Negative 1 plus 48 gives you 47. 1 plus negative 48 gives you negative 47. Negative 2 and 24 gives you 22. 2 and negative 24 gives you negative 22. Negative 3 and 16 gives you 13. 3 and negative 16 gives you negative 13. 4 and 12 give you 8. 4 and negative 12 gives you negative 8. Negative six and eight gives you positive two, and six and negative eight gives you negative two. Like I said, a lot of times the answer is going to come towards the bottom like that. So you have to make sure that you get them all. So you're going to take those two numbers and you're going to put them in your boxes. You're going to take your two x's out of the top left box and put them in that's on those two sides. You're going to take those two numbers, the negative six and the eight, and put them on the outside. And that would be your answer. You would have x minus six and then x plus eight. One thing I want to point out that a lot of people ask too is they always ask which number goes in which box? 
it doesn't matter which number you put in which box. It works the same regardless. You're still going to get the same binomial sets, regardless if you put the A here or you put it there or the negative six here or there. It doesn't matter because you're still going to come out with the same answer either way. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. There actually is a question like that. Number nine that I'm going to ask you all to do here in a few minutes. That is like that. So yeah, you can actually do that. I was going to do that with the answer to that one. So I'll actually come back. Um, the last one I'm going to show you is number eight. Number eight is the is the one example where you can actually have a trinomial where both numbers at the middle and at the end are both negative. For example, you can have x squared minus x minus 72. The method still is the same. Draw your box. Like I said, it's going to sound like a broken record after a while, but the method works. Like I said, repetition gets you to remember how to do it. Top left is going to be x squared. Bottom right is going to be negative 72. Then you're going to factor out negative 72. Because it's a negative number, that lets you know that one of them is going to be positive. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the intercoms are always low. Um, I'm, I'm just going to talk to y'all about it, trying to get them turned up because I can't hear them and they can't hear me. So. Oh, no, you can't hear anything from all this from them. And like, and like, if you have a two bullets, you can literally get Yeah. So, yeah, I need to go talk to him, see how I get through. It's, a, it's an issue. So, anyway, to kind of continue, that's factor out negative 72. Because it's a negative number, that means that you gotta make it to where every single factor says written out twice. So, bear with me. The first one is gonna be negative one and 72. Going to have one in negative 72, negative 2 and 36, 2 and negative 36, that's a good one, negative 3 and 24, 3 and negative 24, negative 4 and 18, 4 and negative 18, 6, I mean negative 6 and 12. 6 and negative 12, negative 8 and 9, and 8 and negative 9. Like I said, the factor sets get to be kind of lengthy. It's not too bad because literally once you find a factor set, I mean, it's, you just have to write it twice. It's not like you're finding 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of them. You're really only finding six of them. You're just writing six of them twice. So it looks a lot worse than what it really is. Once you find... 2 times 36 gives you 72, you just write it twice. So it's, if you really have to this, that's really all the work you're doing. So now you have to add them together and find out what gives you the negative one that's understood to be in front of this X. If you were to go through all these to kind of save y'all a little bit of time, if you did eight plus negative nine, you would get negative one. Like I said, a lot of times the answers come from the very bottom. It's, like it's unfortunate, but it happens a lot. So the answers would be 8x and negative 9x in the boxes. And then the third step is the same. You take your two x's and put them to the left and to the top. You take your negative 9 and move it to the top. Your 8 and move it to the left. And those are your answers. 8 plus, I mean, x plus 8 and x minus nine. And that is how you factor these trinomials using the box method. So now is a good time to ask, is there any questions on all of it in general? Like I said, I know it's a lot of like, you know, repetitive steps. Yes, ma'am. So, hmm. so number 10? Yeah. It actually does factor out. Um, the middle, uh, the middle number in that is a negative. So that means if you do negative one plus negative one, it'll get you negative two. Yeah. 
That one I expected to get more like people trouble. So like I understand. So anyway, what I'm gonna ask y'all to do is I want y'all to do number nine, 10, and I want y'all to do number 11. Number 11, there is a trick to it. Here's your hint. Look at step one. There's a little trick to number 11. So I'll give y'all about five or 10 minutes to do those three. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So like the last thing is eight plus Nope. You can put them in either box, it doesn't matter. You could have put the eight at the top right and the negative nine at the bottom left, and you're still going to get the same binomial. Yeah. So, yeah, it does not matter which one you put them in. Mr. Walcott. 